turn to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6 as we continue on our account of Daniel and the lion's den. Of course, you can see lions about everywhere you look up front up here. And many, of course, you notice when you walked in this morning, things were a little bit different up here. I know that. I shaved, all right? So I realize that. And, uh, and uh, you may have noticed if you're watching anything uh, this morning, I was having a little trouble with my water bottle this morning, all right? It's a new kind this morning. And this, I've had a water bottle all throughout here. But this morning, the first drink I took, I dumped it down my entire tie right before I had to sing there. So you just button the suit coat and keep on rolling, right? And then this, I dropped the lid just now. So today may be the dropsies for me. That's all right. The struggle is real. All right. These are real uh, third world, first world problems. So Daniel chapter six. Thanks again for coming this morning. As you didn't notice, of course, a couple of things done on the stage. And I appreciate all the folks who helped out with that. And the point of all this was to direct attention to the proper place. All right. And that is whoever's singing, whoever's speaking, get your attention right here. So everything else just kind of melts away to the background. And I appreciate all those who help with that. But thanks for being here this morning. And hopefully this, it'll be a blessing to you. And, uh, I, I can't wait until we can all be as a church family again, all right, and, and get this thing behind us. Daniel chapter 6, though, verse number 1, if you look there, please, in your Bibles, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. I'll pause there real quick. We looked at Daniel two weeks ago. And his, uh, his testimony here, his faithfulness, what a tremendous legacy. There's no ill spoken of Daniel throughout the entire Bible. Not one time. Now, Daniel, I don't believe, was perfect. The only one who was perfect was Jesus Christ. But the Bible doesn't record anything negative about Daniel. In fact, when these men were looking, they could find no occasion nor fault in him. It was a final, of course, except for his devotion to God. What a testimony. What a faithful legacy. I hope that to be true of us, but the fact is, if people look pretty closely, they can find some faults with us. Can, can they not? A time when we're maybe impatient, where we're not having the right spirit we're supposed to have, but not, not Daniel. Not Daniel. No, sir. This Daniel, he was faithful. Amazing testimony as he followed his God. If we continue on, please, in verse number five, then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. The only way we're going to get him to slip up is if it's something against, goes against what he finds his God to say. There's going to be times, we're looking at this today, that opposition comes because of our obedience to God. That's okay. That is okay. It's all right where they said, listen, the only way we're going to get him to mess up is when he, when he violates our law because of a greater law. There is always a greater law. That's the law of the sovereign ruler, and his name is God. His name is Jehovah. Then the presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, princes the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the time together, Lord. Thank you for your word, most of all, and for your son, Jesus Christ, his salvation. Lord, bless these few moments we have. Would you make your truth evident in our hearts? Lord, would your spirit touch us and change us? Would you make us more like your son, Jesus Christ? Lord, may we have in some way, shape, or form the testimony, legacy, and trust and belief that Daniel showed. Lord, use this time this morning in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We begin a couple weeks ago to introduce the players in this particular account, this story. Every good story, every good play, every drama has the characters of the story. 
is always a hero. And the, I would say the hero in this story is not Daniel. The hero is God. All right, that's the point of the Bible. The hero is God. But God uses uh, some characters along the way, and he used such a man called Daniel in this passage. Daniel in the book is named after Daniel. We found him in verse number or chapter number 1. We found him in 2 and chapter 3 and not in chapter 4, but chapter 5. We found him again in, here in chapter 6. Daniel's the star. God is the hero. But we have in this chapter some antagonists. So people who are against the main character of the story. We'll look at this morning, but this is the truth. There are always those who are against others. All right, in your life, there will always be people against you and against me. Why? Just the way it is. I would say it is what it is, but I hate that phrase, so I'm not going to say it this morning. Every drama has its characters with different character traits. But here's the point I want you to know this morning, to remember this point, the whole message, that God can work through any characters in your story. Your story may have a different storyline and a different character name, but God can work in any characters, through any characters, in your story. You say, Pastor, you don't know my story, and you're right, I don't. Some of you I know better than others, but I don't know your whole story. I don't know what brought you here today. I don't know what fears you're facing. I can, I can guess, and I can, I can take a gamble at a few things, but God does, and God can work through any characters in your story. We go back to a tragedy in our time in America, and that was the date of 9-11. A shocking day in our history of our country. A day of infamy. A day that changed the landscape of this country. You cannot fly on an airplane now but not be affected by 9-11. You can't go through security and, and not realize it is different than before. Some of the younger children weren't alive back then. It was easier to fly. You could basically walk out to the windows and wave people off, right? Not anymore. Not anymore. But you know that through that time, you can read accounts of folks who were delayed or late because of a situation in their life and they missed the 9-11 tragedy. They should have been in the towers, but they weren't. A CEO was late because... His son started kindergarten that day, and because he was late, he wasn't in the Twin Towers. Another fellow was alive because he was late that morning because it was his turn to bring donuts to the office. Yet that donut run saved his life. One woman was late and is alive today because her alarm didn't go off in time that morning. Another was late because they got stuck in traffic on the New Jersey Turnpike because of an auto accident. One of them missed the bus. One spilled food on her clothes and had to go back home and change. One other car wouldn't start. One went back to answer the telephone. One had a child that dawdled and didn't get ready as soon as they should have. Now, I've been there before in life. I've never, I've never, I've never seen that as a blessing in my life. Have you, Brother Goldsworthy, have you ever said, wow, thank you for being late. Thank you for causing me to leave late. In fact, I usually have about the exact opposite reaction. One put, man put a new pair of shoes on that morning and took various means to get to work. And when he got there, he developed a blister on his foot. So he stopped at the drugstore to buy a Band-Aid. And now he's alive today because of that. So maybe when we're stuck in an elevator behind a slow moving vehicle when our child makes us late, when the donut run takes too long, when you can't find the car keys, when you hit every traffic light, maybe, just maybe, God is working through the characters in your story to do something great on his end. You see, we read Daniel, we read this story, and we've, we know the Daniel Lion Den story. It's a familiar children's story. We read this story and we know the ending. But put yourself in Daniel's shoes for a moment. And just for a moment, think of Daniel do you think it maybe would cross his mind? Probably not, but it crossed our mind. I can't catch a break in life. Every time I turn around, my life takes a turn for the worse. If this is Daniel speaking, but he, he's not going to say this because Daniel was righteous and he believed God like our theme. But I bet we say that sometimes. I know we do. Boy, when it rains, it pours, which means, boy, when something bad happens, more just piles up. And here's Daniel. Every time he turns around, there's a new king and Daniel's in trouble all over again. Yet God is still working in that story. Now I'm going to pause here real quick. We've been sitting at home for a few weeks. At home, you've been comfortable and quiet. I have to remind you, you're back at church now. 
So you have to do me a favor. I've been stuck with just Brother Mitchell shouting amen. All right, but I put him about three rows back so I can hear him the whole service. All right, and he does, he does great. This morning, he's actually preaching at Fairhaven. He should be, Lord willing, be here tonight, all right? So would you do me a favor? Would you practice and say amen for me real quick? Amen. See, that's good. That's good. Can, can I get a praise the Lord? Praise all right, can I get one? Sure. sure. Yeah, that's good. I like that. All right, all right. How about this? Keep preaching. Keep preaching. You don't really mean that. <laughs> you don't mean they're going to be done. We're looking at Dan this morning as God works our stories. I want to look at, first of all, the unfriendly ones, the presidents and the princes. All right? That's in, found in the beginning in verse number one. It, they were important ones. There's only 120 of them in this whole kingdom. There's 120 of these presidents and princes, and they thought they were pretty big stuff. They were important. There's only 120 of us. And uh, look at that. I'm one of the rulers. I'm the one in charge. But wouldn't you know it, they weren't happy with their newfound fame because they weren't the top dog. That spot belonged to whom? To Daniel. He was a top dog. And they couldn't help but be jealous and be petty and be devious because there was someone that was more important, that got more recognition and more fame than they did. Be careful when you find someone who has, has to be on top. Be careful. Well, watch that person. Mark that person. That's what these guys were doing. They had some honor. They had some fame. No doubt very wealthy, but it wasn't enough. They couldn't, they couldn't stand the fact that that guy over there was a little bit more important. We looked at two weeks ago the idea that Daniel was preferred. Or I'll say it this way in the vernacular, Daniel was a teacher's pet. The king loved Daniel the most and they couldn't handle that. They couldn't, they couldn't dwell on that. They had to be those. So opposition should be no surprise to those who follow God. Opposition should be no surprise to those who follow God. Uh, the Bible says this, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You say, well, why would they hate me? I've done nothing wrong. Why would they hate me? I'm trying to be a good citizen. Why would they hate me? I'm just trying to be kind, to be courteous, like we're trying to be as Christians, right? We try to pay our bills and, and do our dues and be a good citizen, vote when we're supposed to vote and, and abide, abide by those things. And, be, and they, why would they hate me? And John says, and then Jesus said this, don't be alarmed. They're going to hate you because they hated me first. Uh, don't be surprised when opposition comes to those who follow God. J.C. Penney's just declared bankruptcy. The founder, J.C. Penn, that was his name, was a Christian. Someone asked him the uh, reason for his success. He said, Jesus Christ and adversity. Foundation for success. You see, we shouldn't be surprised when the world hates us because they've hated Jesus first. There are many things in life that will, uh, that will cause us to have oppression and to have, uh, to have opposition. You see, if the life seems too easy, then maybe, just maybe, you're not going upstream. If life seems too easy, then just maybe you're going with the flow. Someone that you know said this for eight years. Our church was in a court case over a Christian school. Nearly a quarter of a million dollars was raised for the legal defense of Bridgeport Baptist Academy. We had rallies, press conferences, trials, appeals, and more appeals. And during the entire time, God enabled me to maintain a positive attitude and help our church keep our focus on winning people to Christ. Who said that? Pastor R.B. Ouellette. He'll be here tonight. He's preaching in Ohio this morning, driving back to preach the service tonight for our open house service. My one-year anniversary being here as pastor of First Baptist Church. He was gracious enough to do that. He went on to say this, that there was a family that moved up from Detroit. And they had said that they'd heard about the court case and they thought they were coming to a depressed church. But they said when they got here, this is the most, the, the most alive church we've ever been in. We've never known there was a court case if we hadn't been told first. He went on to say this, remember preacher, if it's all right with you, it'll be all right with them. I read that and I thought that's a good challenge for us. Can I extend that a little bit? Listen dads, if it's all right with you, it'll be all right with the family. You keep that outlook. It's okay if God's in control. That's all right. 
Opposition may come, but it's okay. God's still on his throne. He hasn't failed us. He's still there. There may be some presidents. There may be some princes. They may be important. They may be famous. They may be wealthy, and they may not like us. But it's all right because our God is bigger than all of that. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. Thank you. Got to fall asleep up here. It's all right with you, dads. It may be all right with your kids. Moms, if it's all right with you, it may be all right with your little ones. Friend, if it's all right with you at work, it may be all right with your coworkers. They know you're a Christian. When they see your spirit, they may know that's all right because it's all right with you. How do you have that peace? Coworkers, friends, grandpa, grandma, if it's all right with you, it may be all right with your grandchildren. Grandpa's not worried, so I'm not worried. See, there's going to be opposition, but God can work through any antagonist in your story. What's the name of your antagonist? Now, don't name them out loud, please. And if they're in the same house, definitely don't say it out loud. God can still work. Sometimes the antagonist is close to home. Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> That's all right. God can still work. Sometimes they're at work. God can still work. Sometimes they're next door. God can still work. Sometimes they're a boss. God can still work. Sometimes they're at another department store. God can still work. What I'm saying is, no matter who's in the way, God can still work. See, unfriendly. But then I see the unable. If you look in verse 6 of this passage, please, we come to King Darius. King Darius, he, he was a conqueror. He ruled after Belshazzar. King Darius, he's no small character in this story, but he is strangely powerless in this story. He is the king of the conquering nation. He conquered this country, right? He came in and completely controlled this place now. Of all the people in the story, Darius, King Darius, should have had the power to do whatever he wanted to do. You see, Daniel was the king's pet, teacher's pet, and you would think that that would enable him to have the help that he needed, but it didn't matter. Because King Darius in this particular account, in this story, is strangely powerless. We won't look at it all now, but you'll notice, and you've probably heard this before, when the presidents and princes come, they, they ask King Darius to sign the law according to, according to the law of the Medes and Persians. You, you read that before, right? so that it cannot be changed. We'll look at what that exactly means later on. But King Darius has been flattered by these devious men, and, and they've come and said, Oh, king, you're such a great king. Oh, you're so powerful, king. Oh, you're the greatest. So how about we just worship you for a month? And no one else can pray to anyone else except to you, king. Oh, that sounds great. Not realizing that he was binding himself you see, the person who could have been able to help him, was, should have been able to help Daniel, couldn't. He was unable to. And sometimes, even as Christians, we look for help in the wrong places. Ah, you see where I'm going now, don't you? We say, uh-oh, we better get a new law passed. And I'm all for having help in, in politics and policies and laws. I'm all for that. All right, I'm not against that at all. But that's not where our true salvation comes from. Right? That's not where the true answer comes from. And this story helps us understand that. That King Darius, though he was, he, was, uh, uh, will, he was willing to help Daniel, he wanted to help Daniel. He couldn't. He was unable to help him. He was a conqueror. He had conquered a whole nation. The strongest nation in the world at the time he controlled. Yet he was subject to higher rules. And he was conceited. That's how they got this through, because they played to his pride. I don't know what they said when they came in. We see some of it, but I would imagine when, uh, when we get to heaven, they probably filled in a few other adjectives. Oh, King, you're so handsome. Wow, whoa, whoa, don't flex again. You almost broke that robe. Right? I, I can, can, can you read that in the story? They added a few things in there to kind of just pamper him a little bit, to, uh, to soften him up for their... Uh, for, for their request. He was conceited and they played to that. But the answer to the problem wasn't a spiritual ruler, it was a sovereign God. And see, Daniel wasn't concerned about King Darius, he was concerned more about his God. Now, I think, and I believe, and I, I will preach, we need to pray for our leaders. 
need to respect our leaders. All right, listen, whether you voted or didn't vote, whether you voted for who won or didn't win, all right, you need to respect who is in charge. You can disagree, but there are certain things as respect that we ought to have. But ultimately, we have to obey God first of all. You see, the answer is not in the White House. The answer is in God's house. The answer is not in a law, it's found in the lawgiver. The answer is not in a rally, it's found in a revival. The answer is not what I do, the answer is found in what he has done. Listen, I'm not against getting involved and helping and supporting those things, but understand something, my friend, that the ultimate power in this universe is only in God Almighty. The sovereign God, the creator of the universe. In fact, Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. There's a story told of an arrogant, prideful lion. He wanted to find out and remind other animals how great and how powerful he was. So as this little children's story goes, he went to the gazelle and he roared, Who is the king of the jungle? And trembling... The gazelle answered, well, you are, mighty lion. He then went next to the giraffe and roared, who is the king of the jungle? And fearful, the giraffe answered, why, you are, O mighty lion. Next, he went to the monkey and he roared, who is the king of the jungle? And startled, the monkey answered, why, you are, mighty lion. Finally, he went to the elephant And he roared to the elephant, who is the king of the jungle? And the elephant reached out with his trunk, grabbed the lion, and slammed him to the ground and knocked him out. And the lion finally came to. He said, well, just because you didn't know the answer, you didn't have to take it personally. (laughs) The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As rivers of water, he turns it whithersoever he will. People may think they're in charge, but they're not. He's in charge. I've seen God do this. I was thinking back to a time, getting ready for this message when I was in college. My sister and I needed to go someplace. We needed to go meet up with our parents in Chicago. And uh, I went to Bob Jones. They were not known for being super flexible in some of those things. Big institution like that at that time. It couldn't be. My sister and I thought we needed to go, so we went and asked. As we're heading up there, the Lord gave me that verse, Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. We prayed and said, Lord, we need to do this. Would you please make this happen? Knowing that this person we're going to, this dean, who seemed to be 105, was more like probably 75, but 105, maybe 205. Not known to be very uh, flexible, not known to be very generous. We walked into that office, posed our request. I remember the shock in my heart where this particular dean did not even breathe a sigh of dissent. So that sounds tremendous. And that was the whole conversation. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. That person, that antagonist who may seem too tough, remember, God is bigger than they are. That co-worker, God is bigger than they are. That boss, God is bigger. That neighbor, God is bigger. Who is powerless in your story? Because God can work with any and ability in your story. I remember Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. We have the unfriendly, we have the unable And last but not least this morning, we have the unlikely, the lions. Far as I can tell, I've never heard a message preached about the lions in Daniel and the lion then. I've heard about Daniel many times. I've heard about King Darius and the princes, the families afterwards, but not about the lions. See, the lions are a key part to this story. Without the lions, there's no drama. Right? Right? We're going to throw you into a pit of cotton candy. Where's the drama? We're going to shower you with gold and silver and diamonds. Where's the drama? You're going to fall into a pit of earthworms. They will devour you. Really? Over the next 14 million years? Without the lions, there's no drama. Yet there are some lions in this story. In fact, look, if you would, please, in verse number 7. 
where the lions are introduced. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into, help me here, the den of lions. It just sounds bad. Not just one lion, there's a whole den of them. This was not a good place to be thrown. These were angry lions. These were hungry lions. I would say, though, these lions get a bad rap. They're, they're the drama in the story. Oh, no, the den of lions. They're the villains. They're the sharp instruments of a poorly constructed law. They're the enforcers. But they got to be, though, with the instruments of God. They got to be the miracle. There's no miracle in the law. That's what the pagan presence and princes constructed. There's no miracle in the powerless state of King Darius. He stuck himself in that position. There's no miracle in Daniel. We have seen his faithfulness since chapter number one. But these lions, these lions, they got to be the miracle. In their whole time as lions, they didn't do anything as amazing as that day when Daniel was tossed in there. And I would say never again was anything done as amazing as that day they were tossed in. In fact, we could say it this way, hungry lions do what hungry lions do, unless God gets involved. Unless God gets involved, lions do what lions do. Tomahawks in hand, the Indians crept toward the strange tent as they cautiously peered under the flap of the tent, their intention to kill was forgotten. There, in the center of the tent, was a man on his knees. As he prayed, on his knees a rattlesnake crossed his feet and paused in position to strike. But the snake did not strike. It lowered its head again and glided out of the tent. It was years later, when the great missionary David Brainerd found out why the Indians of the village held him in such honor as they did. He expected they wanted to kill him, and they did. The reason for their change of heart was the report from their comrades, their fellow Indians, about the marvelous things they'd seen that day with a little lowly rattlesnake. The unlikely the lions. The amazing, the lions. The miracle, the lions. You see, God can work with any unlikely solution in your story. I don't know what your story may be this morning, but I can guarantee there's probably a problem in it that's any good drama. There's probably a powerless person. It may be you. It may be someone else. You may have someone against you. But I can tell you this, God can work in the most unlikely of ways. I've seen him do that in my life with finances, unlikely means, unlikely ways, through situations, unlikely means, unlikely ways. God sometimes works the most unlikely means. Mr. Tolliver, he was a missionary in West China. They told him of an air raid as Christians, his wife and their six-year-old daughter went through. Having no dugout, they took refuge under the dining room table. As the bombs fell nearby, they bowed and prayed. When the danger had passed, the little girl looked up and said, Daddy, the Lord Jesus is the best dugout, isn't he? Amen. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. It can be a lion, it can be a rattlesnake, or it can be a dining room table. But Jesus is the best dugout. Amen. Dan the lion's den, it's a great story. But there's so much there. Your story is a great story when God gets involved. God can work in any circumstance, through any character in your story. So where's your story at this morning? You discouraged? You depressed? You're disheartened? God, what are you doing? Well, hold on. Be faithful, like Daniel, and watch God work. Lord, I thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for the truth from your word. Lord, we need you. 
Lord, I don't know all the situations going on this morning, all the problems, all the stories here, but you do. You know how to solve them. Lord, help us to be honest. Help us to be faithful. If you're here this morning or at home with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I wondered if maybe in your heart you need the encouragement that God is still in control. You still need to choose to believe God, to be faithful to God. Just a moment, we'll stand. God has touched your heart. You can bend a knee there up here in your seat. Would you turn back to God? Would you let Him work? Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know that you're on your way to heaven. Maybe you're online and this is your first time you've watched a service, but you don't know that if you died that Jesus is your Savior. Can I tell you something, my friend? God loves you and Jesus died for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but everlasting life. The Bible says we're all sinners but Jesus Christ died for us. That God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. And the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life, life in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. And my friend, if you've never trusted Christ would you trust him today? pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And he was buried and that he rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. And my friend, if you've never trusted Christ, would you pray that today? Right where you're at, whether you're here in the auditorium or at home or in a car. Pray that from your heart. It's not in the magic of the words, but in the heart that man believeth. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. It was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you prayed that today, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved just a moment we're going to stand here and if you're here this morning you prayed that would you come let us know come up to the front someone will meet with you i'd love to give you a free book if you're online this morning you prayed that on your screen you'll see a number a website and an email address would you drop me a note leave me a message real quick say pastor i prayed that i'd love to send you a free book lord bless this time in jesus name we stand to your feet the piano's playing already lord touch your heart you can pray where you're at or come forward if you pray that and trust in Christ this morning, would you let us know? There is no secret what God can do.